Good morning. What a beautiful day it is. I want to thank the worship team for just uh, leading us in that worship of God and Andrea for your prayer uh, and just looking up to God. You know, it, you just never want to take for granted. I know Scott has said this often too, that we have a place to come that we can meet in peace and just give God glory and praise. And I just love that we have a sanctuary like this. And that's the whole purpose for this room that we gather into. There's only one reason that that this place exists and that we have dedicated it to God, and that is to come and just pour out our hearts before him, to worship him, to seek him, that his word would be taught in this place and that we could hear it. And uh, it is just such an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. And just to remember, I'm looking at a bunch of people that were made in the image and likeness of Almighty God and that are being made in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the destiny for each person uh, who was created and made and why we are believers. So welcome, and I want to welcome those of you online. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, just happy to be here uh, back at church. I missed the last couple of weeks, and just happy to be here today. So I'd like to begin this message, if you would turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, we're going to look here at verse 18. And there is an instruction that is given to us by Jesus Christ that I find very interesting. And just the nature of it, and we're going to look into it a bit here today. And it's a very clear statement, a clear instruction of what to do. But, but what does it really mean for us today? And it, he says here in Luke chapter 8, in verse 18, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Now, that's kind of an interesting phrase, isn't it? Take heed how you hear. You know, I know that uh, in, in uh, a lot of marriage counselings and things, you know, it's like, he never listens to me. You know, it's like, take heed how you hear, right? You better be listening to understand. But Jesus Christ is saying, take heed how you hear. Well, what is he talking about here? Notice as we continue on, he says, for whoever has... To him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. So that's kind of interesting. We're talking about hearing, and suddenly Jesus continues on with whoever has. And notice the the verses before, uh, back up to 16. He says, no one when he has lit a lamp covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand, that those who enter may see the light, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? We have these concepts in these verses in in 16. We have the concept of seeing, hearing, And possessing. Seeing, hearing, and possessing. We're going to talk about these things today and what the context is. But what is Jesus talking about here when he's talking about a light and the things that are in secret will come to the light? They will no longer be hidden. That we should take heed how we hear And that he who has or possesses what he has, why is that important in how we see and hear? So that's what we're going to dig into today. Now, to really get the full context of what Jesus is teaching here in these verses, we need to go back up to verse number 4 here. So join me in Luke 8, 4 as we start to dig into this. Actually, we're going to start in verse 5. So this is a parable Jesus spoke, and he says, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And a wayside, uh, we don't really use that term as much anymore, but it's, it's basically like a path. If you could think of walking along the road, we have sidewalks, we have pathways that we go on. Some fell along the wayside. It was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it, But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. 
And when he had said these things, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Take heed how you hear. Do you hear what's being said? Now, notice what Jesus says here. His disciples ask him, he says, what does this parable mean? They said to him, and, and he said in verse 10, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Take heed how you hear. You know, sometimes people think that Jesus spoke in parables to make things plain. He actually says here in other places in the Gospels, he spoke in parables to not make it plain. In other words, you have to take heed how you hear. How are you listening? What are you seeing and perceiving? How do you begin to understand what is being taught in the word of God and by Jesus Christ? Now notice what he says here in his explanation of this parable. He says, the seed is the word of God. This is verse 11. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Next it says, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in a time of temptation or that could be of testing, trial, fall away. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. In verse 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So hearing is all about this context of what Jesus is talking about here. He who has ears, let him hear. Consider how you hear. Do you hear with understanding? In what way do you hear? This parable and this teaching of Jesus is about the hearing. There is a sprinkling of the word of God. Does the word of God change? See, the word of God that you read and I read, we might have different translations, but generally speaking, the Bible is the Bible, right? Generally speaking, if we go back and look at the Greek words, the Hebrew words, we see that the Bible is what the Bible is. The Bible has already been written. The Bible is the statements. And as we know from Scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God, that is breathed out by God, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God would be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's pretty exciting, right? So if you want to know what to do, if you want to know the way to go, where to go, if you want to be equipped for every good work, God has already given it to us in his word. He's saying, I'm laying it out for you. 31,000 plus verses, this is for you. All right, that's exciting. But the question is, how do we hear it? The question is, not about the word of God, but about what's going on in here. How are we hearing and perceiving and understanding the things that we read? In what manner do we go about it? Now, a few weeks ago, when I last preached in this congregation, I talked about the difference between seeing the truth and seeing lies, and how if we see and believe in lies, and don't have a value and a love for the truth, we can go down a path that is not good. In fact, uh, hold your place here in Luke 8. Turn with me over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's just look at some verses we read back then, and it was in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and if we could read here together in verse number 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, and now verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned with those who did not uh, believe 
the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, when we talk about those who did not receive a love of the truth, what we're really talking about is, how did you hear? How did you hear it? How did you receive it? What happened when the word came to you? And the question for those of us who are here today online streaming or are, are here to listen is, how are we hearing today? Do we take heed to how we hear? You know that, that instruction from Jesus, take heed to how you hear. He's saying, do you actually think about, are you listening or not? Do you actually take care to note the way that you are hearing? Because in all the parable that Jesus is speaking, the word of God was the same, whether it fell on the wayside, whether it went around the, among the rocks, whether it was among the thorns, or whether it fell in good ground. The seed was the same. The seed was unchanging. The word of God comes in. The question is not about how the word of God works, how it can keep you from sin, how it can bring about salvation in your life. That is not the question. The question is, how do we hear it? How do we perceive it? How do we understand it? And that is really where the question is of the parable, is how do we hear what he is saying? So notice back with me now in uh, Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, so he says of this parable, and we're going to go to the explanation of this parable, he says in verse 11, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, okay? So it's not that they don't hear, it's that they do hear. But then the devil comes in and takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. He comes and takes away the word. Notice back up in, in verse 5, it said, and he sowed seed, and some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down. Now, what happens to seed that falls even on the wayside? If we were putting seed on a sidewalk or on a path in a forest, how effective is that seed when it hits that kind of ground? Not very, right? How, how deep is it going into the ground? You know what's amazing about seed is seed needs certain things to grow, but part of it is it actually has to make it in generally to the ground. In some way, it has to get mixed in with the soil. Otherwise, it, it doesn't really sprout up. It doesn't really grow. It's, it, seed needs certain conditions. But one of the conditions that is here is, and I'm just going to call it, um, what, was, what was happening here is unbelief. How does the devil snatch it away? Hold your place here again and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Notice with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it says, it says this in verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of God, uh, excuse me, of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. The word of God goes out, but basically there's a veil that happens because of unbelief. Hearing that way, how effective will the word be if you receive it and you don't believe it at all? How effective will it be in just laying there and resting? And basically what Jesus is saying, when it falls on the wayside, when it falls on that hardened path, it just sits there and basically the devil comes and just takes it right away. It penetrates nothing into your life. And it's because of unbelief. And because of that, he is able to veil it. He 
it says here in verse 4 of, of 2 Corinthians 4, whose minds the God of the age has blinded who do not believe. Why? He doesn't want the light to shine. The light only shines when there is belief. But what is manifest is that the word doesn't penetrate. It doesn't go in at all. Unbelief. Back to Luke 8 now. He says this. Next. So, it falls, the devil comes, verse 12, takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Unbelief. The next one, the rocks are those who, when they hear, again, they're hearing, receive the word with joy and have no root, who believe for a while and in the time of temptation or testing. fall away. Times of tempting, times of testing, times of trial. Things get hard. So what you received and what you heard takes some measure of form in your heart, but it doesn't last long because this challenges it and it goes by the wayside. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago as well. When God is telling you, hey, bless those who curse you, when you're not being cursed, that sounds like a really good way of life. Yes, that's a good thing. When you're the one being cursed and you're feeling the cursing, it's a different thing, isn't it? That testing and that trial come in to say, now, are you going to actually do it? When somebody is spitefully using you and persecuting you, are you praying for them? See, the real genuineness of the word is tested. How did you hear it? In what way did you receive it? Next he says that those who fell upon the thorns, they are choked out because of what? Cares? Riches? And pleasures? Cares, riches, and pleasures. There's almost no way that if it doesn't hit you by temptation, trial, hardship, that it won't hit you by cares, riches, and pleasures. In other words, hey, you agree with the word. Hey, you receive the word. It's just that you pay no attention after that. Because what your mind is doing is it's being distracted by Cares, riches, and pleasures. You know, Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of riches, the deceitfulness of this world, the deceitfulness of the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of, of how Satan works to say, oh, no, you, 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 you received it. Okay, well, that's level one. You received it. But now let me hit you with some temptation and trial. Oh, you're still going? Well, now let me just give you pleasure. Let me give you things that distract you from the word. You're not disagreeing with it. You're not just going against it. You're not cursing those who curse you. No, you, you bless those who curse you. You pray for those who spitefully use you. But isn't Netflix interesting? You know, it's amazing to watch how in, in communist countries back in the 1950s and the 1960s, Part of keeping people in control is giving them pleasure. So you know what was really cheap in, in, in the Soviet bloc in, in Eastern Europe? Alcohol, right? Alcohol, uh, drugs, and I'm missing one. Man, I forget what it is. What was that? Cigarettes. Thank you, Stephanie. Cigarettes and alcohol. Why were they the cheapest commodities to be found? Because if you can keep people distracted and off on something else, they won't think so hard about reality. You know what the new alcohol and cigarettes is? It's Netflix. It's Prime. Dude, you can sit on your couch and pull up your iPad and you can watch for hours 
You can just like, oh, I'm vegging out. I mean, this whole concept of uh, binge watching, right? I'm going to watch a whole, you know, series of TV shows in one weekend. That's what that looks like. How about I just get you not thinking about anything? How about I get you distracted to not worry about what you're doing with the word? You're not disagreeing with it. You're just not thinking about it. I get you distracted with vice because that's it. And the thing is that whether it's unbelief, testing or trial, or cares, pleasures, and riches, all of it is about the same purpose that the evil one has in our lives, and that is to get you disengaged from God's word. The word doesn't change. The word comes to one who has unbelief. The word comes to one who has trial and testing over the obedience to it. The word comes to those who are distracted by the cares of life, pursuing riches, pursuing pleasures, pursuing what's in this world. It's the same word. And it also comes to those who are of a noble and good heart. That word noble is a word, it basically means beautiful. It's a, like a morally beautiful heart. And I would say, as in some translations, and I like this, and you've probably heard me talk about this before, honest. An honest heart. He says, take heed how you hear. Do we hear with an honest heart, a noble heart, a good heart. Now, what, is, what do we know about the heart? What does the Bible say about the heart? Yes, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Why is it that way? You see, what a really unbelief, re rejecting God's word because of temptation and trial, rejecting God's words, cares, riches, and pleasures. What is that really about in the heart? See, because if we don't face this head on, Jesus' instruction about taking heed about how we hear won't make any sense. Because in our heart of hearts that's deceitful, that's desperately wicked, is a desire to have what we want because we want it. To have it our way. We want it to be the way we want it to be. And if we don't acknowledge that we want it to be the way we want it to be, then all of the hearing is going to get diluted in these three things. We're either going to reject God's word because we simply don't believe it. We're going to reject God's word because we don't like doing it when it's challenged. And we reject God's word because we'd rather just be doing other things. It's so easy to sit around and do nothing. It's so easy to not bring forth fruit for God. But Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you would bear fruit. Bear fruit. See, this is the thing. Look at what he says here. Those with a noble and a good heart. He said, in the ones, this is verse 15, the ones that fell on good ground are those who have heard the word with a noble and good heart. And because they hear it with a noble and good heart, they keep it and they bear fruit with patience. See, the parable that Jesus is teaching here is not random. He's not just saying, this is the way it is with these people, this is the way it is with those people, here's how it is with these people, and then you finally get a fourth group. He's not just saying that. Now, it's true, there are those that just simply have unbelief. There are simply those that won't bear temptation or persecution. They don't like when what they want is tested. There are others that would just be considered and consumed with the, the things of this world. And there are those that will receive it with a good and noble heart. But what I'm challenging you to see here today is, this is all of us. In different ways, it's all of us. 
And when Jesus gives instruction to his disciples, he's saying, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you go into my word. Take heed how the word hits you. In other words, you can be conscientious of the way you listen to God. You can be conscientious to say, am I really hearing God or am I putting the biases and the things that my heart wants into the way I hear God? Oh, uh, that commandment? I like that commandment. That one's coming in. I'm ready with a good and noble heart. Yes, we should do that. That one over there, not so much. I don't even know if I believe that. Well, this one works until it's tested, right? Men and women, they stand before God to get married. Husband, will you love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? Yes, it's all good when you're getting married. That wedding ceremony, that's a yes, yes, yes. Of course I will. Later on, it definitely gets some testing, some trial and some temptation. It's not as easy as you thought it was when you stood before the pastor and before Almighty God and said, yeah, I'm going to love. Ladies, submit to your, yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. Sure. Till you get in and realize who you just committed to, you didn't know how much dirty laundry was there, did you? And dying for that person was easy. And then God says things like, hey, render the affection to the other person. Easy to say when you're getting married. Harder to do once you are married. Because things happen. You start to evaluate in different ways. And so what happens is you look at God's word and he's like, husbands, you do this, this, this. Wives, you do this, this, and this. And then you get into marriage and then what happens is you're like, well, I know God said that, but he did this. She did that. She's like this. He's always doing this. He doesn't listen. She doesn't care. And it all goes on and on and on because now suddenly God's word isn't as important anymore because there's things going on. We're being tested we're being tried. We're like, I don't know if that works anymore. And other things that we desire creep in and keep us from husbands loving their wives, wives submitting to their husbands. And we no longer had this shared thing where we're committed to the good of the other person regardless of what the other person's doing. And you realize that the word of God gets so tested and so tried through the other things of life. And so God says, through Jesus, take heed how you hear. Because in any given time, in any given circumstance, we are going to have these attitudes in the way we hear God's word. And believe it, that it changes depending on where you are in your life. See, you, you can stand up and commit to the Lord God in the way you're going to be as a husband and a wife. But does it still look that way five years later? You're still here in the same way? How about 10 years, 15, 20? Do you still hear the same way? Did God's word that was so pure in the beginning become adulterated through unbelief, through trial and testing, and just through other interests? And see, the beauty of the relationship that anybody who's been married knows the challenges and the things that can come along is that God is saying, don't you see this is the mystery of Christ and the church? I'm teaching you about the way it is. How do you hear? How do you relate? Do you realize that Christ had to die for us when we were yet enemies? Do you realize that Christ laid down himself when there was no submission? Do you realize that he was doing things for us that we did not merit? And do we realize, ladies, that he said, and when you do it, don't look at the merit of your husband. 
He says, submit yourselves to your husband as unto the Lord. You see, it's a test and a judgment for every married couple to see whether we will actually obey the word of God. He's saying, husbands, you do this as Jesus did it. And wives, you do it as if you're doing it to the Lord. Now you're going to find joy and happiness. You think you're going to find it in some other way? You think not believing what I told you to do? You think that the testing, knocking that out, you think your desires for other things in this marriage are going to produce it? He's saying, you're missing the whole thing. You're not hearing right anymore. You're not hearing right because your heart wants what it wants. Your heart is saying, I don't like it that way. It's too painful to give when I'm not receiving what I need. When my needs aren't being taken care of, I can't give to somebody else. Welcome to the world of Jesus. What does it say in Philippians 3? The apostle Paul said, I count everything that I could boast in. He said, my birthright, I'm a Benjamin, I'm of the tribe of Israel. I was zealous uh, you know, for the law of Pharisee. I was blameless according to the law. He's like, I have all these things I can boast about. I was circumcised the eighth day. You want to talk about flesh? Paul's saying, I can do it all. He said, I count it all as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he said that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. See, our ears change when we don't accept what even knowing Jesus and having an identity in him is all about. You see, the word of God was delivered to us as God sent forth his Holy Spirit to speak through the prophets, to speak through the writers, the apostles. He was telling us, David, this is my thinking. Now, how do I hear that thinking? How do I receive that thinking? And what he does is he says, Ron, here's what I'm telling you. Stephanie, here's the way it's coming down. Dorian, this is my way. And you see, for all of us, we get this opportunity to take heed how we hear. To say, am I believing God's word? When I read this, am I believing this is the word of God? Do I Do I take it past the written text to the author who's in heaven? Do I commit to it knowing what might be coming? Do I listen to it when it's tough to listen to it? When it seems to go against what is paining me? Do I listen to it despite what I really want to do? First time I ever had this happen in my life, I was 15 years old. God had been working on my heart for about a year before that, whether he existed or not, whether there was a God. I remember as clear as day, riding home from school, I was looking at the sun that was low in the sky, and I'm like, is there a God? Why am I here? What's going on on this planet Why do I exist here? Why do I have thoughts here? Why is there a sun? Why is there a moon? Why is there a planet? Why are there laws? Why can I see there are things that are good and things that are bad? And for about a year, God was making me challenge as a 14-year-old, what is going on? And in the end, my conclusion was, there is no way any of this happened without God. I simply did not have enough faith to believe all of this was without a creator. I I had to deny, I couldn't deny what I could see. The evidence was all around me. But then I got challenged at 15 whether the Sabbath had been done away. I grew up in a Christian home and I believed that the Sabbath had been done away. And the reason why is I went to a school a Lutheran school, I went to a church where we were taught to keep God's commandments, so thank you for teaching me that. But when it came to the one, I'm like, we memorize this commandment, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How come we don't do this one? 
And I remember when I asked, and I told my mom, she's like, David, you asked the same question I asked when I was a little kid. Why don't we do this one? It seems kind of odd, right? We do one, two, well, in those days, three was the Sabbath commandment. So one, two, don't do three, but we do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They took out two, and you know, you know how that works, right? You read the Bible, and the Sabbath commandment's four. You read it in a list at certain churches, it's number three. But to me, we didn't do number three. It's like, it's so weird. You're telling me I need to honor my parents, but you're telling me I can skip this one. So some people say, oh, no, no, David, you don't have to skip it. It got changed to Sunday. Oh, I'd go and ask somebody else. They say, no, 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 you don't have to do that one anymore. No, 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 you don't have to keep God's commandments anymore. No, no, it's whatever day you choose. And so by the time I got to my teen years, I had about 10 reasons why I was told I don't have to do this. You know what was interesting? Nobody actually showed me any of those answers in the Bible. Not one. Not one. But I heard them. Take heed how you hear. What are you listening for? And what I hit when I was 15 was a challenge. What did God say? Now, I'm going to tell you this. This is about the best advice I can give you. If you take one thing from the sermon, I'm giving it to you in this moment right here. When you open the Word of God to study any subjects or any verses, pray a prayer and say, Father, help me to hear your voice and understand your heart and your mind and what I'm about to read. Help me to hear you. It's the best advice I can give you. If you will just do that, I assure you, your life will be revitalized because it's going to keep you with a noble, beautiful, good, and honest heart that when you hear the word of God, that's the way you hear it. You see, submitting to the creator and the writer of the book is the important thing. If you go in as if this is just a book of knowledge and you're studying the words and you're trying to figure it all out, it's just like a piece of literature, Don't make the Bible a piece of literature. Make it what it is in truth, the word of God with his instruction, direction, correction, teaching to you and me. We have to hear his voice. So I started going through the New Testament with one question. God, what do you think of the Sabbath day? And God, do I even need to keep your commandments anymore? You tell me. You tell me. I have no dog in this fight. I'm going to take away all my bias. I'm just going to listen. I choose to hear. I start going through Matthew. I don't see Jesus taking away the Sabbath. I see Jesus saying, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to magnify it. Don't think that I came to do that, Matthew chapter 5. I see Jesus on the Sabbath being challenged about whether he's keeping it or not. I never heard Jesus say, well, we don't even have to do this anymore. He actually said how you do it. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He actually was acknowledging the Sabbath, and he says, oh, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, Jesus' thought is, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus' thought is, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, never once challenged the existence of a Sabbath, the keeping of a Sabbath, and actually spends maybe as much time as with any commandment that I found actually teaching how to observe it. He was saying, you guys, are you're missing the whole point here. The Sabbath was made to give rest. The Sabbath was made to give mercy. There's a reason I said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you work and do all your labor. The seventh day is a day of rest. You shall rest in it, and you shall give rest to your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, the foreigner. All Jesus was doing was living out the commandment. He's walking around giving mercy, giving freedom, as it talks about in Deuteronomy 5, to to say, Remember you were slaves, now I'm freeing you. You needed rest, I'm giving it to you. You need some mercy, here it is for you. He was so 
wonderfully fulfilling the law of his father. You know what that inspired me to think? Me too. Jesus did it. I want to do it. I get to the book of Acts. Nowhere does it take it away. I start reading about the things that were being changes, but then Paul, he's, he's every week, he's going to the synagogues to talk about things and teach Jews and Gentiles on the Sabbath. He goes out to the riverside where prayer is customarily made on the Sabbath, and he's talking with people who become believers, and he delivers the gospel to them. And I read through all the rest of the books of the New Testament, and by the time I hit Revelation, I knew it was done. Because once you go through 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, there is no thought in your mind that God did away with his commandments and that you shouldn't be keeping them, and they aren't about love. And once I saw that, I'm like, so this is about love. Love for God, love for man. Well, this is totally what we should be doing. So I realized I had a choice. Grew up raised in a Lutheran church, going every Sunday, thinking that maybe there was a Sabbath, maybe there wasn't, now I know there is, but it's on the seventh day, not the first, that I should be acknowledging what God created, because after I went through the New Testament, you know what I did? I went back to the Old Testament. Oh, God was the one who thought this up. God was the one who created this thing. God was the one who rained bread for 40 years, except on the seventh day, for 40 years. God was the one that said, remember it and keep it. God was the one that said, if you don't keep it, I'm going to put you to death. God was the one that said, I'm sending my people into uh, slavery, into bondage, because they didn't keep my Sabbaths. And he was the one that sent Nehemiah back. And Nehemiah, when he saw people breaking the Sabbath, said, God, hold this to my good. That when people tried to break the Sabbath, I said no. And I told them I'd actually physically beat them up if they tried to work on the Sabbath. It's like, okay, God's servants are serious about this thing. I want to be too. But what did that mean? Hey, David, you threw out your unbelief, but kids are going to make fun of you when you attend your Catholic high school and when you won't go to football games on Friday night and you won't go do your own pleasure, and you won't be about doing other things, and no longer are you going to play football on Saturdays, and no longer are you playing basketball on Saturdays, and no longer are you going to be doing your work, because I used to do tons of landscaping on Saturdays, and all of a sudden now I have to cut out my income, now I have to cut out other things. See, that was the real test. The test was, would I do what I heard God say. See, these verses that we've been covering today, they became a reality in that moment because I can still remember coming to the conclusion that this is legit. Now what am I going to do about it? And the first thing I thought was this means no more, <laughs> no more fun for Davy on Friday night and Saturday. That's what I thought. Now, it's fun, but it's in a different way. And the other thing I realized was that I can't work anymore. And the other thing I realized is this is going to change my relationships. And I started to think through it. And I realized, but then here's the point. If I listen to all of that, then I'm not listening to this. But if God is real and this is his word, there is no other choice because I would rather be right with God and wrong with everybody else. And that's where it began. Now, read this with me. He says here, in Luke chapter 8, he says, verse 16, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. Nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. How you and I hear the word of God 
always manifests itself and is plain to see. You might be deceiving yourself into thinking that you can get away with it, pretending you're doing something and not. You're not hiding a single thing from the Lord God Almighty. Whatever is in your heart and the way you listen to his word and what's going on, he knows it all. He knows your thought before it can even hit your mouth to speak it. He knows what is inside. It is not hidden from him. It is always brought to light by him, and he knows that's what it is. And whatever you hear will be manifest. Whatever it uh, is received as will come to light. And he's saying, look, you're not receiving the word and it not showing up how you're hearing it. It won't happen. It's always going to show up. Either you just reject it because you don't believe it. You end up letting it go because you hit trial and persecution and don't want to keep following it. You get distracted because you want other things and you don't want God's word or you receive it with a good, noble, honest heart. You keep it, and you bear fruit with patience. This is it. This is it for everybody. And this is where the difference between truth and lies come into our heart. Because when the word of God comes forward, you and I get a choice of how we hear. God says to you, your sins are washed away and forgiven. You are holy and accepted in the beloved. And in our hearts, we're like, I don't know if I believe that one. I don't know. I, I don't think you've really understood, God, my sin here. Like somehow God didn't see all your sin. When he proclaims that I forgive you by the blood of my son, that his sacrifice was for you, you're holy and accepted in the beloved. Do you believe that? Because this is one of the biggest challenges we humanly face. Do I accept my identity in Christ? If we do, beautiful. Now you get to go to stage two. Testing, trial. We sin, we fall short. Oh, no. Does that go back to unbelief then? It's like... All these things start to come through. And what is seeing is, are you maintaining what you've heard? Are you believing it? Are you keeping it? Do you have a patience with it? Are you walking in it? Because what God is asking for are those that will receive the truth and believe it. Because ultimately, the whole question of life always goes back to the Garden of Eden. You have God saying one thing. You have the devil saying something else. And you get to come under the authority of which one you want. Do you want to be under the authority of God? Then you've got to receive the word honestly and do it. Do you want to be under the devil? Then don't believe it. Reject it when you feel tested and go after other things of this world that block it out. Because ultimately, that's our choice. And God is so good. He is so gracious. He's saying, I let you choose. And then Jesus says, but take heed how you hear. Because you can't hide from the choice. God gives us. He called heaven and earth to witness to the children of Israel this day. Who will you choose? He says, serve God or serve not. Choose blessing or cursing. Life or death. Which do you choose? And he's saying, I'm setting it before you. And he says, and I counsel you, choose life. Choose life. I'm rooting for you. Choose life. But he lets us make the choice. He gives us the dignity to choose how we hear. He gives us the dignity to choose what we will believe. And he's saying, I'm empowering you by giving you the truth. Now, here it is. Do you want it? Do you really want it? Because if you do, you're going to keep it and you're going to bear fruit with it. It will always come. You cannot hide from the truth. And God didn't give us the truth to hide it. God didn't give us truth so it would be knowledge and we never use it. When he's saying here, when one has it, or excuse me, verse 16, no one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but he sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. He's, he's saying to you, you would never get the truth and then not use it. That, that would be kind of ridiculous. It's like lighting a lamp. You have this light, and you're like, nah, and you set it away. But that's what 
we do when we hear and don't apply it, when we don't use it. It's exactly what we do. It's like saying, I need a light on in this room. Oh, well, here's a light for you. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bury that for now. I just want it to stay dark. And sometimes we lie. I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The biggest lies we tell are the ones we tell ourselves. We say we want light, but we won't walk in light. I have people come and say, how come God's not blessing me in my marriage? Why is God not blessing me in my finances? Are you doing the things he already told you to do? If, you're, if you haven't tested God, whether he wants to bless you, do the things he says in his word. You don't have money? Why not? Do you know what God said? He who loves wine and oil will never be rich. In other words, you want to spend your money on a bunch of stuff, you're not going to have it. It's kind of your choice. You don't want to tithe to me? Hey, you're not going to be blessed. You, you want to test me? Try me. See, we, we, when we're honest with God's word, we go in with a desire just to say, what do you want me to do? How can I be successful in this, in that? How can I find you? Chris Carlson gave a beautiful talk today about fasting. And, and here's the reality. I know that most of you just don't spend time fasting. I don't know why. Because Jesus says his disciples will fast. I don't know why when we experience the blessings of fasting and giving your time to God, Chris tested God's word and Chris testified God's word is true and what he could not figure out before that was challenging his belief, he gave in to God's word to hear what it said and he testified it's produced fruit because he gave heed to God's word and it did something different. You say, oh, I don't like fasting. Me neither. But now I love fasting. I used to fast in flesh, and it was like everything I could do to make it through the day. I would stay up as late as I could studying the Bible so I could sleep as late the next day as possible so I had as little time <laughs> till I could eat because I would fast from sundown to sundown. It was like, can I just make it to sundown? That's where it started for me. But you know, you got to start somewhere. Now I don't even care anymore about the food. It's just a matter of the time. Maybe that's the bigger thing to fast. My time or God's time. And maybe the real issue for you isn't food at all. It's just giving God time. I assure you, if you listen to what he says about fasting... And it's all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament about fasting. You're not going to be disappointed if you pour your heart into obeying God's word and seeking his face and seeking his way for you, your little ones, and your possessions. You're, you're not going to despise the time. He will open you up if you want to be opened up. But you're going to have to obey the word. Chris said he couldn't figure it out ahead of time, but now he knows. And like he said, you just got to do it. A good understanding have all those who do the commandments. There's a reason God said that. A good understanding have, are those who do the commandments, right? Psalm 119. A good understanding. Do you want a good understanding? If you say, you're reading God's word, God, I don't understand this. Pray and ask. And then do it. Do what he says. This isn't mystical. This isn't... The illusion, the illusion is what the devil's doing. He's pulling off the con on everybody. The word of God is in every house because anybody that has a, a device has got access to the word of God. The Bible's the number one selling book in the world, way beyond anybody else. It's in more hands than anything else. Why isn't it followed and obeyed? It's not about the word, it's about the hearing. And we're not hearing what it says. But the mystery that we should understand is this. It's not found in the word. It's found in our hearing. The Bible is spoken. It's us who the issue is with. And we can hear what God wants us to hear. Now he says here in Luke chapter 8, he says, 
Verse 18, then, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whatever does not have, or excuse me, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. What does this have to do with hearing? If you are hearing the word of God, as God delivered it, receiving it with an honest heart and saying, this is what he says, you may now possess that word. You can possess it. You see, for me, in in my testimony here today, when I went through the word of God and listened to God, I realized, man, this He still wants me to keep his commandments, okay? And he still wants me to remember the Sabbath. He never said stop. Until he says stop, I don't stop. So he says, you're going to keep my commandments, okay? So I'm going to see these commandments. I'm going to learn about these commandments. I'm going to discover these commandments. And the more I discover, the more I realize the spirit in the commandments. And as I've shared with you before, the real place to come to is seeing Christ in the commandments, because when you see Christ in the commandments, now you understand why he loved feeding the 5,000, because he was obeying in the spirit the law, thou shalt not steal. Maybe you're saying, well, how does that relate? Because the spirit of the law is how you should be giving and generous. You wouldn't take from somebody, you're looking to give to somebody, This was Jesus' heart. This was why he was moved with compassion. This is why he wanted to give healing to people. This is why he wanted to be generous and offer it out. Now, his word here to us, the Lord Jesus says, whoever has to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away. I didn't know till I went through the Sabbath what that meant, but I can tell you now by experience what it means. If you will hear God's word, seeing and understanding what he says, in order to possess it, to do it, he'll give you more of it. But if you come to the crossroads and you say, "Mm, no, I'd rather do this. I'd rather, I believe that your word, God, but but when this happens, I don't want to do it anymore. I'd rather go after my own things in life. He's saying, whoever does not have even what he seems to have will be taken from him. You want to find God not giving you more opening of his heart, his mind, and his revelation? Just don't do what he says. He's like, if you won't do what I first said, why would I give you more to do? Why would I give you more understanding if you really don't want the understanding I've already given to you? Because what are we doing here? If you don't want it, don't. He said, and those who think they have it, no, you're going to lose even that, what you think you have. But if you have it, I'm going to give you more of it. That's why he says, take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever will receive of the word of God, even more of the word of God will be given. Even more understanding, even more instruction. And here's the great thing, is that the more we receive of God's word, it's not just about having a knowledge or a practice or a a religious way of doing something. It's about having God himself. And if in all of your hearing you don't find God himself in it, you're still not listening right. When I first started keeping the Sabbath, I went to a church that kept the Sabbath And you know what became the emphasis in the church? The Sabbath. It would be a big mistake for Rock Valley to overemphasize the Sabbath. We emphasize it because you're probably not going to hear it taught other places. But the fact of the matter is, if our purpose here is the Sabbath, we still aren't listening. Because what I found was, in going after, oh, we keep the Sabbath, oh, We keep the holy days. Oh, we follow certain of the fleshly ordinances in the Old Testament. Not others, but certain of them. And that makes us God's people. Well, You know what the Pharisees did? They kept the Sabbath. They kept the feast days. They kept clean and unclean. 
Did that make them Jesus' disciples? See, the whole point was, in hearing, you got something right, but you know what got rejected? God himself. What a tragedy that is. To be so hearing that it sends you right back to unbelief. Because you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power of it. You think you're coming to God, but all you did was come to practice. And you find a way of living that's different, and you think that's God? That's not God. God is in his word. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Do we understand what he's saying? We've got to hear that too. The Sabbath was made as a gift to you and me. It was made to be a time special between us and God. It was meant that we could stop what we do and have relationship with God and have relationship with others where we take time to worship him, praise him, adore him, and receive of his mercies, receive of the time together, and it's a time that we take to pour out those mercies, to pour out that goodness, to pour it out. We're not looking here to check off a box that we did something. We're looking to have a relationship with Almighty God who made us. And the truth doesn't get hurt because in trying to hear what we do is we start bringing in our own biases. We're better now because we do this compared to somebody else. We have the law and they do not. Pharisee of Pharisees, wake up. Don't you see that in your thinking of being right, you've been made more wrong than the other. Go back to your unbelief because that's just where you went. You think in practice that gives you relationship with God? The relationship with God has to be at the core and center and then have your practice. It was God who gave you and me the Sabbath as a gift. But we were not made so that we would keep the Sabbath. We were not made to do these things. We were made to be like God. God is wanting us to be like him. And there is nothing that is just of the flesh that is of God. He is of spirit. Jesus said the time is coming then they will worship me in spirit and in truth. We still read the Bible with the blinders on in the Old Testament thinking that somehow the fleshly ordinances are going to perfect what God has begun in the spirit. I tell you, it's foolishness to think that this is how you're perfected, but rather, when we read the law, do we see God in it and the spirit of it? It's easy to put a little checkbox by the things you do of the flesh. Not as easy to do the things that are done of the spirit. So we neglect the spiritual things to go after physical things. If you desire to do the physical and your conscience convicts you so, so be it. But do not do the physical and leave justice, mercy, and faith undone. That would be a crime. If the word of God is not leading you to love and humility, but rather to arrogance, condescension toward others, and putting them down for not believing, I say, you who think you hear, you don't hear. The word of God needs to be heard. Take heed how you hear. God wants us to see, hear, and possess his word. He wants us to see, hear, and have him as our own. God is looking for a relationship with you that is so powerful and driving in your life that you will sacrifice of the cares of the world. You will Go right through the trials, not caring what befalls you because you have a belief and conviction in who he is and that drives you through to obey the word of God despite the odds, not caring for self, but caring for God Almighty and those who are before you. And friends, as a church, as a people, as believers, this is what God wants us to hear. And so Jesus says, take heed how you hear. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we delight in you. Father in heaven, we love you. Father, it's you who speak your word. It is you who chasten us. It is you who instruct us. And God, we love you that you sent your son Jesus to bring us near to you into your most holy place. God, we cannot come of our own wisdom or strength. We accept the sacrifice of your son. We believe that our Lord Jesus came to this earth, that he died for us and for all of our sins to pay the price of death, that he was resurrected from the dead after three days and three nights, and that he is now seated next to you at your right hand. And it is in his name, in his name alone, that we have salvation, that we have power, that we have authority to be your children on this earth. And we desire, God, that your gospel would go forth in our own personal lives, in this church and to this world, that we would shine as a light, that we would bring fruit forth for you, God. And we desire that you would help us to know how to abide in you, to walk with you, to honor you. And God, please help us to see how we have been biased in our listening, how we choose some verses over another, how we haven't been honest with your word and correct us. Make us honest of heart and mind that we may glorify you, that we may serve you, that we may submit to you in our lives. God, submission to you means love, joy, peace. We believe. You, God, are our only God. You're the only God who comes with no side effects, with no cursings, but only blessings in you. We choose life. We choose blessing. We choose you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor David, and thank you all for joining us this Sabbath. Uh, just a reminder for those of you after the services, for those of you that want to pray with somebody, we have a prayer team in the front as well. Right now we're going to sing another song called Glorious Day, so please uh, stand and join us. was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that guy away? It was my tomb till I met